Unit 4, Research Methods. Section 1, Validity and Reliability. Okay, so today we're going to discuss uh, reliability. Uh, and importantly, we're going to discuss what it is, what the different types of re reliability are, and ultimately why it is important in research. Okay, so let's uh, use an example study um, to help us guide us through. So we're going to look at a study with the effect of creatine on sprinting performance. You may have been familiar with this one already. Um, so the, the researchers did a pretest 30 meter sprint. They then got the subjects to train for four weeks taking creatine and then did a 30 meter sprint test afterwards. And they wanted to see whether creatine would improve their sprint times. Now in this case the researchers found no improvement in sprint time after four weeks. However, as good researchers we must ask ourselves whether the results that we found can be believed. Have we found the truth? And this is to do this is where we have to ask ourselves, are our results reliable? Now, reliability. Reliability is whether if you carried the same project out again, you would get the same or similar results. Now, this is obviously quite important because uh, in theory, if we carried out that same study with the same group of subjects, let's say in a month's time, um, we should get the same results. Creatine hasn't changed. Creatine either works or it doesn't. Um, and this is where we have to assess the reliability of a study. Okay, so there are three main types of reliability. We have something called inter-researcher reliability. We have test-retest reliability. And we have measurement error. And it's those three things that we're going to discuss today. Okay, so let's discuss inter-researcher reliability, the first one. Now this is quite simple. Imagine you've got a scientist, a sports scientist, and he decides to conduct a study looking at hand grip strength. And he asks the first subject to uh, do the hand grip test, holding out the hand grip dynamometer to the side. However, he can't do all the testing on his own, so he's got another researcher to help him. However, this researcher asks the uh, subjects to hold the grip dynamometer at a right angle in their elbow and up in the air. Now what we can see here is the same study is, is asking people to do things in different ways. And so what we've got here is potentially our subjects might get different results purely because the researchers have asked them to do different things. And this is a real problem and this is unreliability. To be reliable everything needs to be consistent. And so this is inter-researcher reliability. Another way of looking at this is if you were doing something a little bit more um, sort of observation based. So imagine that you've, uh, you're watching a children's uh, PE lesson and you're trying to monitor their behaviour. So you've asked some researchers to grade their behaviour from a scale of 1 to 10. So researcher number 1 uh, watches the lesson and grades the children's behaviour at 7. However, the other researcher watches the same lesson, same children, and only grades it at 4. Now this is a really, again, a big issue because the researchers are disagreeing and we need consistency in order for our results to be the same next time. So if they were watching another lesson, they should be grading the same. Okay, let's talk about the second one. So this is called test-retest reliability. Um, to be reliable, the test itself must yield consistent data. So whatever we're using as a test, it must be consistent. Okay, so if we, for example, go back to our study and we consider the effect of creatine, we've used here a 30 meter sprint test. And so we must be sure that the difference in sprint results, if there is any, is purely down to the creatine and that nothing else has affected the results at any point, either the pretest or the post test. So we have something called intervening factors. So these intervening factors could be a number of things, uh, and these factors are things that will affect the reliability or would change the scenario from the pre-test and the post-test. So let's consider an example. Uh, one could be sleep. The subjects may have had uh, more or less sleep on the pre and the post-test. And of course if they've not had the same level of sleep both times, their results in the sprint could be slightly different purely down to that. We could also have things like fatigue, so for example previous exercise. So uh, one subject may have done the pre-test sprint uh, fresh and ready and done a, you know, got a really good score. And then even though the creatine has improved the 
their sprinting performance after the four weeks. Because they were so tired, maybe from a previous training session or playing a football match the day before, they actually recorded a very low sprint score, making it look like the creatine made them worse, even though they got better. Uh, supplements is another big issue. Um, you know, if people are taking other supplements, um, maybe uh, you know, in this study, as well as creatine, maybe taking protein or HMB or something like that, um, these supplements could uh, distort the values that we're getting. Another obvious one is just caffeine. Um, you know, caffeine can have a huge effect on sprint time. And if someone had had a caffeinated drink before one of the sprints, they may have actually got quicker purely down to that, and not because of the creatine. And another obvious one is just the weather. Um, obviously, if one set of sprints were done in the dry and one were done in the wet, uh, you'd expect the dry scores to be higher. Uh, sorry, to, to be quicker. Uh, and so, therefore, again, that's distorting the results. So we're not finding the truth. We're having our results distorted by these intervening factors. Um, another one to look at is not just the test itself, but maybe in this case, we've, we've actually got a four-week block of training. And it's possible that there's been some uh, intervening factors in these four weeks. So, for example, some of the subjects might not have actually done the training correctly. So, um, you know, actually the creatine might have had an effect, but they didn't do it properly. Uh, they may not have taken the creatine correctly. Um, quite often these sort of studies involve taking it six times a day. Um, and they may have not done that. They may have missed some, uh, some, uh, some taking of it. And because of that, the creatine's not had the effect we expected, but it's not the creatine as such, it's actually the subjects. And of course we might have things like injury, I mean a, su a subject might have only actually done two weeks of training because they were injured. Okay, so let's move on to the very last one, and this is measurement error. Um, so our third type of, or our third issue with reliability, is actually how good our tools are at doing the measurement. So here we're taking a blood sample from a rower, and we're going to measure the lactic acid uh, that's circulating in their blood. Now, obviously, if we take a sample of blood that you can see in the picture uh, and test it three times for the amount of lactic acid, that one sample of blood should produce the same result all three times uh, because it's the same sample of blood. However, as you can see from the diagram, it hasn't. And so, therefore, we've actually got a problem with the machine or, or the measurement error. And that's, again, something we have to question when we're using pieces of equipment. So the equipment we must use uh, must be reliable. OK, so why is all this important? Well, ultimately, we need to judge how truthful our study is, how correct is the answer. And this might be our own study, or it might be someone else's. So we can judge how accurate the results are by measuring the reliability. So we can actually measure reliability. Uh, that's something that we may cover more in lectures. We can also control reliability. So you can all probably already start to think with things like sleep and supplements uh, and fatigue. Those intervening factors can be controlled uh, and so therefore prevent any uh, problems with them. So if we've got high reliability, that's a mark of a really good study. Um, if we've got low reliability, then obviously that's quite a bad study. Uh, and they, this is again a good way of being critical of past research and also being critical of our own. You know, have we done the best job? Okay, so in conclusion, reliability is about ensuring consistency, doing the same thing every time. This way we can make sure that the results are truthful and accurate.